Okay, well, I'm Mary Morash, uh, professor at School of Criminal Justice, Michigan State University. And he, we're here today in San Francisco at the American Society of Criminology meetings. Um, and I'm here to interview Mita Chesney Lind, a good friend of mine, a colleague, um, and someone who's had an enormous impact on criminology as a field. Um, I'm going to mention just a few of the many, many awards and recognition she has uh, received. One is the Western Society of Criminology recently named an award after her, which is the Mita Chesney Lind Award, which will be given each year to somebody who advances our understanding of gender. Uh, the second is an honorary degree from her alma mater, mm -hmm. uh, Western, uh, Whitman excuse College. me, Whitman College, um, and she was given an honorary degree there, and as we talk, she will be telling us a little bit more about that and uh, why that was a particularly meaningful event. <laughs> she also, in the past, won an award called the Hindelang Award, very prestigious, from the American Society of Criminology. She and her co-author, Randy Sheldon, wrote a book about girls and uh, criminology and their offenses, uh, or alleged offenses in some cases, mm -hmm. uh, which was an early impact on the field that shaped our understanding of uh, gender and crime. So I'm going to do this sort of like a life narrative. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> because I've been learning myself about hmm. life narrative theory. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> and and Just, what this means is the information won't necessarily be accurate, okay. but it will reveal ah. your current identity. <laughs> and okay. so right. I think that's what we're interested hmm. in at this point. Um, so the first question is really just, how did you get into this work? And what was it like when you first started doing this work on uh, gender, and crime, and especially girls and delinquency? Okay, well, I, I, there, there are two separate questions, actually, because one was, how did I get interested in the law and justice issues? And I didn't come through the normal pathway, I don't think, because what was happening in the years when I was an undergraduate was I was watching people being criminalized for opposing a war that most of us regarded as immoral. And I was thinking about people going to jail who shouldn't be going to jail because they were acting on matters of principle and conscience. And many of us felt that the war that they were being sent to fight in was um, not only immoral but illegal uh, in international law. So I, I didn't say, I want to start studying female offenders. I really came in saying, I want to study crime and, the, and basically the process of labeling people as criminal. So, but then by the, if you just do the math and look at my face, you can figure out I was also going to graduate school at the beginning of the women's, the, the second wave of feminism in the United States. So it was unavoidable that those of us who were involved in the anti-war work would meet other people who were involved in uh, the women's movement. And those two movements were pretty much entwined in, in my um, graduate career. So how did I get involved in female delinquency? Well. I was casting about for a topic for my master's thesis, and my uh, then advisor had gotten all the family court records from uh, all the years of, of the Honolulu family court. And I remember it was like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Here was this room just full of all these files, and there was this guy named Dutch in the room, and he was saying, you know, um, you know, how can I help you, Mita? And I'm looking at this room going, I'll never get out of graduate school. I will be here for the rest of my life, and I just need a data set. So I said to him, because I'd been in the women's movement, I said, do you ever see any women's files? He says, oh, not very often. But I'll put them aside for you if you want me to. And so that, that was how I got started. And so I just went back to the room, the Raiders on the Lost Ark room, and here was this small little box of files that he put aside for me. And I just started reading the files. And I didn't understand that if I was reading files from the 1930s, I was actually doing historical sociology, not sociology. Uh, but that, Steve Swassman, one of, my, one of the people who have, did affect my work and who helped me along the way, explained that to me. But at the time, I was just reading these files, looking at the fact that these girls were all charged with waywardness and sexual immorality. They were also being given physical exams. And I knew that if you had a free day in your life, that was not how you wanted to spend it as a young woman. 
getting a, a gynecological exam. I mean, it was something you did for your health, but it was not a fun thing, and I couldn't imagine it being done in the context of having been arrested. So, and I just, then I, and, and everything in the 30s, um, in Honolulu, like in many parts of the country, extensively documented, lots of involvement of police and probation officers and pretty extensive files. And so I just started reading, and that became my master's thesis. And um, then I got derailed, if you will, and, and went into another topic for my dissertation. But along the way, I wrote one paper um, that appeared in, in an issue of Issues in Criminology that I think was the first sort of collection. It was published by the Berkeley School of Criminology right before it ceased to exist. And Dory Klein had work in there, June Kress had work in there, and my paper was in there. So I've always been lucky in my friends, like you, and that was just an amazing publication to be a part of. Um, and after that, Psychology Today contacted me and I began to get the idea that, wow, there's a lot of interest in this topic. And at, at that point I had data on the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s. So I, for Psychology Today I updated it and tried to look at what was happening. Um, nationally, uh, not just in Hawaii anymore, but nationally around girls and juvenile justice. So um, I kept that work going, um, and that's pretty much, you know, I've just never stopped after, you know, there was, my dissertation was actually on abortion rights, and it turns out I'm, I'm going to have to go back to that work too, because our work's never done as we seek to, you know, improve the world for girls and women. and. You know, that, that work, um, Hawaii was the first state in the, in the nation that decriminalized abortion, essentially. And we were doing early interviews with girls and women who were getting a legal abortion for the first time and girls who it was too late for them and they were having to put their babies up for adoption or reconcile their, their futures. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's been, a, it's been a great ride ever since graduate school. So were you in the mainstream? Did you find everyone receptive to what was going on? Um, Most did you people feel thought totally I... welcomed into the field of criminology. No, oh no. Um, well, not even sociology, for that matter. Um, I, uh, luckily, I wasn't paying much attention to what people in authority were saying to me. <laughs> but uh, at, in those years, I, we had very little reason to trust them. Uh, so I was just doing work that I thought was important. But at some point, I realized I need some help you know, doing this. And I was fortunate in some of my mentoring uh, and, and not so fortunate in other of my mentoring, you know, we could wander off down the, that path. But I think in general, what I discovered with the academics that I knew during that period were a couple of things. Number one, that people who had my politics were gonna have a very, very difficult time getting a, a regular academic job. The people that I knew who were slightly older than I was were getting fired from their academic jobs, especially in the field. Criminology wasn't looming large on my horizon, but sociology was. I was getting a PhD in sociology. I knew what the teaching load was in most California campuses, and I knew that many people were getting fired for doing um, progressive work, what we now call progressive work. So I thought, well, look, I have friends that will help me my, my fellow graduate students at Hawaii uh, will get me a job in the community colleges and then I can keep doing this work. And I, and I you know, um, so I just said, well, hey, if the teaching load in California is four and you've got to do different preps, I can do three sections of marriage and the family and two sections of intro soch and do the work I care about. So that was the choice I made in the mid 70s was to not look for an academic job, but to basically teach in the community colleges and kind of keep working while I was doing that. Mm -hmm. And then I was rescued. The great thing about Hawaii is it's a small place and people take care of each other. And one of my um, former men, well, and current mentors, I, uh, I think he's still with us, um, recognized that I was in the community colleges working and I had this juvenile justice background. So he got me to a half-time research position at the, the Center for Youth Research, or you, he called it the Youth Development and Research Center. So then I had a foot in the community doing basically social work and social welfare research and teaching half-time in the community colleges, which suited me fine for about a decade. And then mm -hmm. Lee Bowker, another of my mentors, said, Mita, you have to get out of that job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you have to get a job with less teaching. 
And I had pretty much concluded that that was the case. And about that time, women's studies opened up for me. And uh, so that's and that how I got at there. the University of Hawaii. Uh, University of Hawaii. So then I just basically moved over my other half to, uh, it was a little more complicated than that. But yeah, so I escaped, um, the, I think, the, the sort of the purges that were going on of, of leftist scholars in the early to mid-70s, uh, where people like Carol Ehrlich and others that I knew, close friends of mine were being denied tenure mm -hmm. with my politics. I just knew that wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to stop doing what I wanted to do. I was, I wanted to do this writing. So that, it was hard, but easy, ultimately. <laughs> so when did you start to identify as a criminologist as opposed to a man, or do you identify as I a do. criminologist? I do, I do. And, and what happened was, um, I, well, actually, the first paper I ever get, I mean, some of these are like dream things that happen to you and never happen again. And, you know, we've all been in rooms where we've given papers with six people in the room, and I did it today, so I have no illusions that, you know, my life has just been one trajectory of wonderfulness. But the very first paper I ever gave, I was a graduate student, it was 1974, Pacific Sociological Association in Scottsdale, Arizona. I was there sleeping on my brother's floor, literally. He had a water bed that somehow had broken and there was no water in it. It was just like, why are we in this frame with this flattened water bed? But <laughs> we slept. And we, we got ourselves over to the Scottsdale Inn or wherever it was for this, for this session. They had one gender session for uh -huh. all of PSA. And again, the room was just packed. and was, It was a huge crowd. And I was scared to death and I had my little nose, years you had the three by five cards and you were reading three by five cards, no PowerPoints, no nothing, just winging it, no you know, tables uh, that you could count on people being able to see. Anyway, gave the presentation and a guy, I've, I have no idea who was, the very back of the room stood up and he said, that's the most important paper I've heard presented in these meetings in 20 years. And I said, okay, I'll take that. I didn't say that. I, I just you know, kind of smiled, and my, my mentor, Lee Bowker, who had been sitting up in the front of the, front of the uh, room, had a big, huge grin on his face, and he got up and walked out right after that. He was just, it was done. Uh, so that certainly, you know, got me encouraged. Uh, but then I discovered, looking around, that there were these criminology meetings that had more of the people I was interested in hearing um, going to them. And uh, people like Estelle Friedman, um, I'm trying to think uh, who else, Mil Mildred Pagelo, Lee was mm -hmm. at that point had shifted over and was doing criminology, uh, Joy Pollock, who's another of Lee's students. Uh, it, uh, one of the very first pieces I published after that Issues in Criminology article was in a book that Lee did on women and crime. So um, I, I, and I came to this ASC meeting, I think in 19, God, I remember what it was. I, I just knew that no one in Hawaii knew about the work I was publishing, and the few who did hated it and, and were very angry with me for writing what I was writing. And so I didn't know that you could go to a meeting where somebody would hand you your name tag and say, oh, I really like your work. So I was hooked after that. I just said, okay, I so, can go to so these meetings. So what was the content that was so disturbing to people? Or that oh, they thought well, was so important. I was talking about discrimination against girls in okay. the juvenile justice system in those years. And their feeling was they were protecting girls. And they, the, the girls that were in detention needed to be there to keep them safe. Mm -hmm. And I remember being toe-to-toe -to -toe with, a, with a, a family court judge. Um, and, and he was looming over me, you know, basically telling me that he knew what was best for those girls. Um, he and I ultimately ended up on, on the same side down the road a piece, and I'm, I'm glad that that happened too, because he ultimately, I think, in his heart of hearts, did care about kids. But he was a traditional family court judge with very traditional attitudes about what was good for girls, and that he knew what that was, and it meant that he, they needed to listen to him, they needed to stay in school, they needed to, you know, go to the detention center as a consequence if they ran from home and, you know, didn't do what their parents told them to do. And I was saying, you know, you're acting, this is not a, a justice that you're meeting out for boys. And so I started with discrimination against girls. And I, I was always skeptical of the labels being applied to girls. But then Mildred Pagelo at that same meeting that I went to where the person said, I like your work, said to me, why do you suppose the girls run from home? 
So the luck of going to these meetings is that you get good mm -hmm. questions. That you, you know, so that's why I keep coming back because I always experience, I always take more from these meetings than I think I give. And that's a good thing about these settings and these so places. Did you ever find any hostility within the criminology meetings? Or were you able to isolate your audience to the people <laughs> who agreed with you? Both. Um, I certainly, um, I think there, I'll be talking tomorrow about some data that we've gathered on what this, what this organization looks like in terms of gender now. And I think it's a very, it's a very complicated picture. It's not simply that everything's a lot better than it was before. Um, there's a reason that we've had two women presidents, and I'm not sure the reason is a good one. It's that it's a lot of work, and it doesn't necessarily give you the prestige that some of these other awards do that don't involve any work, candidly. Um, so, you know, as an example, I think for many years all of us said, if we could only get a woman to be president of the society, and then you realize that's like you're, the, you're not the student body president, you're the, like the student body secretary. You know, you have to take all the minutes and do all the work. Uh, anyway, that's the kind of nuance that I think, you know, we need to, and, and I do look at the, at, and, we, and my student and I do look at what's the membership look like, what's the uh, publication criminology, which is our premier, probably arguably our, our, our field's premier journal, what does it look like in terms of authorship, male, female, and we look by ethnicity as well, and then we look at some of the key awards, and then we talk about, you know, what, what, what does it mean to have a meeting in a place as privileged as this space for us as an organization, especially those of us who are progressives and still want to see an end to mass incarceration, and we want this society to look more like the people that we that we imprison and process. So anyway, though, so it, it, I, I, you know, I think I think it's um, I'm I'm happy to be a criminologist, and I I've certainly found great friends and great support. I think when you find um, like-minded people, you're so drawn to them. And that was what happened to me too. I remember early on meeting you, meeting Betsy Stanko, meeting Nicole uh, Han Rafter, and just going, I want to play with these people. I, I want to spend a lot of time talking to them. And, and you know, that's really the networks that I've established in these meetings. And Randy Sheldon, we would have never had the book mm -hmm. if it hadn't been for these kinds of meetings. I know that what you've done through your career, a lot of it has been to re-remind people of things. Mm. Like we <laughs> remind that what's really happening to girls in detention centers. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you've also kind of gone into a lot of other directions. Like I know right now you're very interested in sort of an international yes, perspective yeah, on right. girls. What of the, and I've just mentioned a couple of the areas, when you think of the vast variety of areas you've looked at, what would you say has been the most fulfilling to research yeah. and write about and why? Well, I actually, making a difference is, is the most important for me in the lives of girls and women who are in this system. And so it was probably getting a call from somebody uh, uh, in the U.S. Congress saying they were going to have a hearing on girls in the juvenile justice system and they wanted me to come testify. And, uh, you know, I remember thinking this, this is, it, it isn't perfect and, you know, we, it ended up being not as perfect as we wanted it to be. Both times the, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention looked at girls. But I think it's really important that at the highest levels in our government, there were people having, and, and, and supportive uh, legislators listening to what the problems were for the girls in the juvenile justice system. And I see myself as part of a movement of academics and practitioners who made that a priority. And I just did the work they needed to have done. Um, and, and then you have to look around and then, you know, Life is data, and where I live, we have lots of problems in our juvenile justice system, and I can see those problems, and so I have to assume they probably exist other places. And Increasingly, we have access to so much more information uh, about 
a lot of things, and, you know, because of the internet. So it's a lot easier, I think. In the early days, I mean, even just to get arrest trends, you had to get your Okole down to the library and dig around in the federal documents and where's that little teeny publication that gave you arrest mm -hmm. data. And then you could just beep, 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 go online, BGS, prisoners in the U.S. You know, I have downloaded that so many times that you know, I've got mm -hmm. like 100 copies of, the, of each of those data sets. So, um, but I think what's given me the greatest pleasure is that, you know, You've, you've done some, even though I, don't, I know that progress is, is overrated as a social goal, you like to think this work is making a difference and, and you, you want it to make more difference and so you keep going back and trying to do a better job. I don't think academics are particularly well suited to this task. You know, you and I have talked about that um, and especially some of our colleagues are not well suited and in fact look down on this is back to some of the resistance I think some people look on that work as quote unquote applied and if I'm a pure theorist you know I'm just thinking great thoughts and understanding the world and I I don't see that as our job and I don't see that as even I don't want to sound anti-theoretical because I'm, I'm drawn to some of those ideas but I think the work has to matter, and if the theory is really important, you know it. it it'll it'll come out of the work that's that's important, not like I have the grand theory and then I apply it to the world. It's sort of the difference. Although both of these are, are flawed characters, but you know they're Platonic thinkers who just have the perfect chair and then impose it on the world. And then there's the mm -hmm. Aristotelian, which is you build it up from that. And I've always been an Aristotelian thinker, mm -hmm. except for the part where Aristotle thought that what females were fundamentally flawed. Okay. <laughs> Except for that part. Right. Yeah. So so when you look at everything you've done, which has oh, yeah. been for many, many different years yep. and gravitated more and more to criminology. Yep. Um, what's your greatest frustration in terms of what you haven't been yeah. able to look at? Oh or God, do the or... problems are so immense that we're up against. Um, you know, we have more girls uh, pr proportionately in the juvenile justice system than when I started. There are many more girls proportionally getting arrested. So it, it hasn't been that as a result of our focusing on girls' lives that we've seen a, a great change for the better. I think it's, um, somebody said at one of the sessions that we were both in this morning, patriarchy is enormously nimble. and the relabeling of girls uh, from runaways to violent girls, the way that racism has also crept into the system. So I guess I, I feel like my research agenda is not one that I'm in control of. My research agenda is I wake up in the morning and, and what's happened, and sometimes that you hear somebody on NPR talking about mean girls, and you realize, I don't like why this is so popular. <laughs> so that got me off on all that research on indirect aggression and covert aggression and misogyny. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of it's just ephemeral. The global stuff, that really came as a result of working where I work with wonderful colleagues um, like Tony Mahade and um, Gita Naupani, who uh, are just fabulous feminist scholars um, in Nepal and from Bangladesh. She's now, um, Tony is now in Switzerland. But they're like, pay attention to what's happening to the women in our country. And, and look at the links between you know, the work that you're doing in the US and, the, and domestic violence and violence against women and the role of the justice system in either ignoring or paying attention to girls and women. So once I, once I could understand what was happening in the US in the global context, and I'll, I'll back up and tell one last story. Um, you've heard this, but others might not have heard it. I was meeting this, uh, uh, she's a feminist in Malaysia, and she's an Islamic feminist in Malaysia, and very much under pressure uh, from the Malaysian government, which has been trying to silence feminist voices. And she was very interested in the work we're doing around girls and running away from home. And I, I finally said, you're being awfully generous you know, why, why are you so interested in this? She said, well, it's just like our Sharia courts. And I went, wow, I get this. 
and so somehow that tilted things so that I began to see, and I think as the years have gone by, we've seen this with right-wing politicians worldwide using women's bodies and women's sexuality and the control of same to, particularly in insidious interactions with systems of religious, um, I'd almost say oppression, um, but, but religious systems colluding with politicians who then deploy criminal justice systems basically for patriarchal purposes and also for their own political ends. And you see that happening globally and, and, and it's certainly happening in the U.S. It was manifest in the, what the Democratic Party called the War on Women in 2012. I don't think it's gone away. Uh, but I also knew from my friends who were in India and my friends who were in these other countries that they were fighting those same systems. So suddenly it was like, wow. And so I think it, it's really important that the conversation become global and become global fast, that we talk about how sexual assault is treated in India, how um, harassment of women in public transportation and in public is significant in Nepal, it's significant in India, and, and we're not just talking about sexual harassment, we're talking about sexual assaults on buses that, that girls and women are forced to endure and how that relates to a woman walking down the street in New York and having to negotiate all the cat calls that she receives. We're out in public being reminded constantly of, of our place, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's in Nepal or whether it's in India or whether it's in New York City. And that hopefully disrupts that discourse of, you know, the George W. Bush and Laura Bush, oh, we're going to Afghanistan to save those poor women, you mm -hmm. know, we the enlightened Americans. I'm going to switch topics a little bit. Um, I know you've done everything from mild encouragement in a close encounter of people doing this kind of work, trying to okay. encourage them to go on and do yeah. more, people you don't know necessarily that well, to what I call major heavy mentoring of okay. students, yeah. maybe junior faculty. Yeah. What's that all about? Why are you doing that? And how does that fit in with Well, your I never work? had children. Oh, that's interesting. I, 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 the other big aha moment I had when I was in graduate school, which, you know, you constantly go back and revisit, is, uh -huh. um, you know, I saw my friends who had kids, some of whom had not planned to have kids. Remember the context, mm -hmm. you know. We, um, and so it was like, well, I don't. That isn't the only way to play nurturing. Uh, and so I'm. I'm so fortunate that I get to teach college because that's a great age in which to take over from people's parents and to sort of say, well, okay, we'll take it from here. And I've enjoyed that process a lot and I've enjoyed the relationships that I have with younger colleagues and, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 that and having a lot of cats. You know, you, 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 you kind of handle the baby cute thing. I, in fact, I offended one of my friends. I said if I could have given birth to a, a litter of cats, I would have done it. <laughs> but children are a lot more work. And I could see that early on. And I, I wasn't sure I had the temperament for it. And especially without any of the social supports that young women who live uh -huh. in, in enlightened countries like France, uh, who aren't necessarily gender enlightened, but who at least understand if we want to reproduce and have another generation of smart people, you need to get, give some help to mothers. Mm -hmm. Because the young women that I was in graduate school with who had children were just being driven nuts by the, by the pressures. Mm -hmm. And there's no good time. I mean, now I've gone back, you know, you go back over decisions like that. I wrote my dissertation on motherhood and decided it didn't pencil out for women. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a hell of a lot of work. We have a pronatalist culture. Uh, some would say that it's, you know, we're only being encouraged to do this, so there's another generation of men and young women to go fight in wars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there, I mean, there are all these layers to it, but yeah, nurturing is a fun thing to do. That's really interesting because it makes me think about how we've cut benefits to the core for yeah. disabled people, older people, mentally ill people, um, people who have young children they have to take oh, yeah. care of oh, often yeah. alone and how much that has to do with what we're doing in criminal justice. We yep. wouldn't have so many people to deal with. That's right. If that's we right. hadn't done that. Well, that's the part of Jonathan's uh, Simon's work governing through crime that mm -hmm. I think is so interesting. That in this this world, this terrain we find ourselves on where we've shifted all the money from classrooms to cells 
and we've we've just got more and more unruly and desperately um, miserable people that we have to control and and an elite that could care less you know I mm -hmm. mean we're we're on a terrain I think I've lived long enough in the US to to go from well we have a few problems but I think we can deal with this too like you know I I I I studied history in college, and you know, this could not end well for mm -hmm. us as a culture. I mean, I, I saw governing elites in the countries that I studied, from decline and fall of the Roman Empire to what happened in Russia. I mean, you, you, empires don't always just get better and better and better and better, and this, this empire seems in some rather serious and challenging terrain, it seems to me. And all you have to do is walk around this hotel and see how many desperately poor people there are panhandling to, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it does, you don't have to have any kind of great insight to, to see that this is a world I didn't grow up in, mm -hmm. and I don't think either of us did, and we grew up in very different parts of the country. So, yeah, I, I'm very worried about um, the future, and, but then it's like, you know, if the plane is going down, do you want to be in the cockpit or in the back of the plane drinking champagne? You know, I'm going to be in the mm -hmm. cockpit. <laughs> so what would you tell new scholars about how to get into the cockpit and stay there <sighs> and, and be sort of normal <laughs> and happy people? I, at some point, I decided uh, you better start exercising. <laughs> uh, it's gonna, there's going to be a lot of stress. And yeah, one of my friends today was talking about my work because, you know, like I say, one, one reason I loved coming to these meetings was they met people who liked what I wrote because the local people who did read what I wrote, and said, you know, made, made yeah. it very clear to me that I should stop writing what I was writing. And, and what Dan McAleer said was, well, you had all the right enemies. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think, um, I think you, you, you understand, I mean, I guess, I, I, you know, I, I always think, I, I want to believe with Gandhi that we live in a moral universe and that, you know, I don't know what, if anything, exists past this, but we have this. So it's like a canvas, you know, what do you want to leave? You know, mm -hmm. this is, this is, this is the shot you get. And so I, I've certainly made some stupid mistakes and um, who knows, you know, to advise other people about things. I think I heard you talking to a young woman today and you said follow your passion mm -hmm. and I think I did that and and I remember one one of my mentors I won't say his name because of what I'm going to say afterwards because he read the earliest thing that I submitted because I knew um, he was a very big deal in ASA and he'd come everyone wanted to come to Hawaii for a while and so he came and so I asked him to read my paper and he said I have absolutely no interest in this topic, but you write well. <laughs> <laughs> so I've learned to get right past that kind uh -huh. of stuff. But, but I've had a fair amount of damning with faint praise. Uh, yeah. And I, I think in, in our field, globally, that's the reality that feminist scholars face, mm -hmm. is that we're, we're, we're kind of, oh, look, there they are still at it. And this morning I ran into somebody who said, now there's a new group of uh, leftist men who are blaming us somehow for mass incarceration by talking about violence against women. And I'm sure maybe that's not a charitable interpretation of what they were saying. But it's like, oh good, <laughs> something new to write about. <laughs> I can take that one on pretty easily. Okay, well, I've kind of come to the end of my questions, but is there anything else you think is important? To... Humor. I think humor is very, very important. Yeah. Uh, and a little training in the theater doesn't hurt. Uh -huh. uh, if you're gonna be in this field, I mean, I, I luckily love talking to groups and I love um, entertaining. When I was in middle school, I was doing stand-up comedy uh, and, and, and so good at it, they were like having assemblies for me. I didn't even know what I was doing. Uh, so I think, I think if, you, if you're going to survive in this business and be a good teacher as well as a good scholar, and especially if you want to have an impact in the policy world, you have to be able to talk about your ideas in ways that are engaging, entertaining, and and still you know get get the message through. So mm -hmm. as much as this this lecture has really been kind of a bit gloom and doom, I really try in the talks that I give to be anything but that to just kind of mm -hmm. get people swept along with you know don't you want to come on this ride? It's going to be a great one. 
Well, I know after going out to dinner with you last night, you were hilarious. <laughs> Thank I you. felt much better. <laughs> so that's I think that's it. it. I think we're done. How's that sound? <laughs> and we're right on schedule here. Yeah.